thank you everyone for joining me today. Um, my project is titled The Role of Powers in Padas 3 and 4 in the Yoga Sutra, Realities and Implications. And then first off, I just have a quick question, which I asked last year, if you remember, um, is just by raise of hands to take the temperature in the room. Has anybody here had an experience um, or something that happened that was bizarre or unexplainable? Okay, so I would say like the overwhelming just by this um, small sample size evidence is that there may be something going on here, the things that have, there are things that are happening that are outside of our current model of understanding. So this paper seeks to explore how a text like the Yoga Sutra can offer a lens with which to view the cities or powers and evaluate them. So um, the cities are translated to something like perfections or supernatural, supersensory magical abilities that which is beyond the five senses. They've been called many names and they weren't codified until the early centuries CE. However, the term city has become the most synonymous word in the English language for the powers. Um, and this might be due to the central role of the word city and siddha in the Shaiva and Tantra religious traditions um, in South Asia. So this has been undergoing a resurgence in the last year, these tantric ideas due to influences like the human potential movement. There's many psychedelic Renaissance in the mid 20th century. And Jeff Kreipel denotes this as the tantric transition. Um, sutra in Sanskrit uh, means thread. So the Yoga Sutra then contains the threads of yoga, which is originally what got me thinking about this idea of a, like a woven reality. Um, it was composed somewhere between third to fifth century CE by a sage named Patanjali. No one's really sure who that is, but that's kind of beside the point, I guess. <laughs> it's part of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, which includes the Yoga Bhasha and um, or the explanation of yoga, and it's attributed to Vyasa, which is just a generic term for a compiler. So there's a little bit of mystery around who exactly put this all together. Um, its timing is not exact on the commentary either. Um, some scholars see it as an auto commentary on the sutras just to further explicate uh, what it's saying. So in 1.2, Yoga Chitta Britsi Narodaha defines yoga as the restraint of the fluctuations of the mind. And the translation I tend to prefer is yoga is the stilling of the modifications of consciousness. So this is just to acknowledge that there are always multiple translations available, always room for interpretation. Um, either way, this is telling us that chitta, meaning mind, consciousness, or intelligence, is something that can be stilled or that yoga can help one more or less refine. Given the lack of consensus as to what consciousness is or the mind is, um, and how that relates to the concept of a higher power, the Yoga Sutra provides a framework which broadens the scope of consciousness beyond five senses. And um, potentially ultimately concludes that the cities are a distraction um, to moksha or liberation or you know, whatever the goal of yoga is, even if that goal is just letting go. Um, and so on the other side of it, they reveal the human potential for you know, shifts in consciousness and where human consciousness could evolve in a positive way given the ethical component. They signify reorganizing of the subtle body resulting from an activation of primordial elements or tapas. Um, and this reorganization organization offers a newfound direction for uh, understanding the material world. And so this next slide is um, just to demonstrate how the powers were eventually codified into eight in Vyasa's commentary. And I won't get too far into that, but I think this photo by the artist Alex Gray demonstrates the concepts of the city arising um, in terms of seeing this inherent paradox, to see the bones and the molecular reality that it invokes within the great expanse of nature and the lightness coming from that field of consciousness. So there's an acknowledgement of expansion and contraction. Um, and so moving forward, I'll talk more about Padas 3 and 4 as the framework to talk about the city. Um, so even within the Yoga Sutra, there are a variety of translations. I just stuck with one, which is Yoga and the Luminous by Dr. Chappell. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, and this innate multivalency makes the practice and study of yoga philosophy potent because um, there's this kind of prevalence of borrowing and exchange among coexisting strands of thought. So the Yoga Sutra is considered one of the most significant yoga texts and has made the Eightland framework the standard among modern postural yoga schools. And there have been many different frameworks throughout the years. 
um, rising in popularity since the 19th century, it had fallen into obscurity um, for, for a very long time until British and also Indian Orientalists took up Sanskrit and they translated the text to the best of their abilities and mostly to support this Orientalist outlook, which imposes uh, Western hermeneutical ways of dealing with an Indian text as developed in the interpretation of the Bible. It's kind of the stance I'm taking on it. Um, so essentially, like the practice of yoga was co-opted, and it reduced much of what yoga is according to a singular text, much like the Bible has been advertised as the authority on Christianity, when the reality is that both texts have many versions, interpretations, translations. Um, the Bhagavad Gita has a similar history. So this made it possible for various groups to sort of take from it what they want and what aligns with their chosen philosophy and discard the rest. Um, and so throughout the 19th century, there was an effort because of the pull of this Western Protestant framework to reject the portion of the Yoga Sutra that explores the cities uh, because the cities don't fit into that framework and therefore were often ignored or dismissed. Um, so this framework disavowed itself of the cities as a natural consequence of the hermeneutical lens. Then as discussed earlier, there was the resurgence of Tantra in the 20th century. Jeff Kripal calls this the tantric transmission. Developments in psychology, for example, and quantum physics relating to Einstein's theories of general relativity and space-time started shifting this hermeneutic lens in the late 19th to 20th century. Um, providing the basis for more of an inter interdisciplinary approach to analyzing the cities. Padas three and four are radical in the sense of asserting that the cities arise from samyama, a skill of intense laser-like focus on the essence of an object, which elicits a deeper perception on the nature of reality and how mind via the senses can alter that reality. Contending for the possibility of the supernatural or the paranormal, my paper considers how the Yoga Sutra conceptualizes these cities, as well as the realities and implications of that codification. So here the paranormal or supernatural refers to, you know, anything that's just beyond the five senses and the subjective experience of that. Um, so what this validation for the cities demonstrates, at least my val own validation for the cities, is a dissolution of the Western Protestant hermeneutical principles which deny the cities. Um, it signifies a reopening and the possibility of reading a text like the Yoga Sutra without maybe as much bias coming from the Western lens, since that lens itself is undergoing a change. Um, it's a conversation for dualities, planting seeds for the need for new metaphor, which can sew parts together and grappling with the tension caused by you know, living in a universe in a world that's in constant change and flux. Suffering arises from the attachment to form. Pada three is called Vibhuti Pada, contains the V, which is a prefix and intensifier, and then the um, verb root flu, meaning to become. So it translates to, translates to something like might, great power, super, superhuman power. And as I already said, the way the cities arise is with the beginning premise of Samyama. So the way I'm, I'm visualizing Samyama is kind of like this rainbow wheel where from the point of concentration of dharana on a single point extends out to an intention, becomes absorbed in samadhi, and then kind of everything comes together and opens up. And at the beginning of Pada 3 is an explanation of Samyama. So first it says consciousness, concentration of the mind is its binding to a place. The extension of one intention there is meditation. And when that purpose alone shines forth as if empty of own form, that indeed is samadhi, and the unity of these three is samyama. So I just wanted to show that from the text. And um, from what there unfolds in that moment of like intense concentration, it's a sequence of paranamas or transformations of consciousness. So then this comes down to the realm of the guna, which are the three strands of um, matter or property, and they fluctuate to create various forms. And then one is able to go beyond and reconstitute the guna as a result. So this is all kind of philosophical metaphorical talk. So bear with me here. Um, the booty or intellect in the sattvic state must then dissolve in order for property matter to realize the nature of purusha and attain kaivalya, meaning space, isolation, or freedom. Gotta skip a few here. Uh, I'll still be here all day. <laughs> 
So then we'll move on to Kaivalya Pada, and um, this is the first sutra. Chapel translates for one as perfections are born due to birth, drug, mantra, austerity, or samadhi. So what's interesting about this is Patanjali is acknowledging that there are multiple paths to the city. Um, and so I find that, that aspect of it very intriguing. Um, in 4.34, it talks about the relationship between the gunas and the idea of returning to the origin of the gunas. Um, this concluding sutra describes yoga as an embodied experience that is finding steadfastness in between the form and formless, which is kaivalyam, and this reveals the power of higher consciousness that is revealed through the cities as well. Now, conceptual metaphor theory and embodied cognition to kind of tie this into metaphor can help us understand why practices and texts like the Yoga Sutra invoke transformations of consciousness. So in order to shift frameworks or states of consciousness, um, underlying frameworks of reality must shift away from materialist notions of consciousness and matter. Conceptual metaphors speak to the understanding of one idea um, in terms of another. So you can think of this, of the culturally embedded metaphor of love as a journey. Um, and so the conceptual system is more of like a web or a network. It's metaphorical in nature, grounded in the physical body's experience via webs of association in the mind. So that kind of explains why mandalas and um, mantras, like we practice this at the beginning of class today, well, not really class, but whatever this is. <laughs> and these webs of different metaphors and code layered aspects of reality that are often multivalent and paradoxical. Um, this comes from Lakoff and Johnson and their ideas on conceptual metaphors and image schemas, which I won't touch on, but kind of contrast the Chomsky and generative um, approach. So another scholar on this topic I really like, Tamal Sinai, suggests there's a meta-language forms in tantric texts. And these texts outline an elaborate system of subtle body practices that acknowledge the metaphoric nature of experience. And so tantric texts can be a framework for other texts, like the Yoga Sutra. So I'm using that lens to look at the cities as well. And I'm not necessarily thinking about the cities of like, oh, I'm actually gonna be literally able to fly tomorrow, which would be really cool, but more so in terms of embodied aspects, whether it be of deities, focus on Brahma Baharas and compassion, um, or just learning tools to get into the subtle body through language. Because what I've learned through studying linguistics is that there's elements of space and time encoded in the human word and that creation is in constant flux. So perhaps the divine communicates in symbols and language. Thought forms kind of just appear like waves in the ocean. So the only way to shift our reality is to get behind these frameworks and these belief systems we have that are structuring experience of reality. Um, learning how to read the ocean better in surf speed. The Yoga Sutra utilizes metaphorical thought to codify systems for consciousness transformation and discusses extraordinary abilities of practitioners as evidence for their effectiveness. So in a way, it's like a marketing technique. Um, this is the difference between classical Cartesian model of the mind, where the body, world, perception, and action are understood independently, and the embodied cognition of, on the right, which says that they're all understood to be dynamically related. Next, I wanted to share um, a portion from the Rig Veda, which is from over 3,000 years ago. Um, just to show how this metaphor of reality as a fabric is not something that just came out of nowhere. The sacrifice, drawn out with threads on every side, stretched by the song of 100 singers in one, fathers who appear gathered, read these songs. We sit beside the warp and chant, read fast, read forth, man stretches it and man shrinks it, even the mold of heaven he has reached with it. So as I started looking at the connection between geometry, shapes of forms, toroidal fields, all these crazy places I've let my mind go, um, or if anyone has ever heard of Buckminster Fuller, it's all speaking to this idea that reality can be broken down into constituent parts that all come together um, to create this gestalt of an experience. So the cities are somehow like a subtleization of that ability, which I think is somehow inherently coded in our minds or consciousness. Um, some of the metaphors that I find the most interesting are, of course, the cosmic dance, evident in Samsi and the Yoga Sutra, um, where property, property realizes the nature of Purusha. The karma chills out and the cities start to come through. Another one from Samkhya and the Yoga Sutra is that of the gunas, the strands which are constantly shifting and fluctuating, evoking this image of waves, which all tie into electromagnetism. The gunas originally inspired me to connect some samkhya with quantum string theory. I was like, oh, there's a little connection here. So there's a lot of things in yoga to be explored here. 
Um, and I'm really interested in the Tantra concept of Spanda, which denotes a spiritual dynamism, a throb, or the de divine creative pulsation. Um, next, the universe is a hologram or mirror or some sort of reflection of the relationship between form and formless. This is evident in the Yoga Shista and many Buddhist texts in the sense that reality is somehow reflected or projected from some greater reality and light source um, that we can't ordinarily see until there's some sort of experience that flips the script, um, which echoes Plato's allegory of the cave. Um, lastly, and perhaps my favorite is the idea of reality as a fabric within a grid, that there's an underlying structure that the gunas need in order to fluctuate. I feel like this slide represents what I'm trying to say, again, using metaphor. So I wanted to, to speak again about paradox, and it reminded me of one of my favorite Ram Dass quotes. If you push too hard to get free of what you've been trapped in, that very pushing entraps you. Then you see the whole process is constantly the ascent and the descent, and it's all just a liquid process in which both are going on all the time. You're constantly bringing spirit down into form, and you're constantly as a form moving towards spirit or the formless. It's the dance of form and formless. So in the Lakoffian model, viewing the universe and its reflections as a cosmic dance provides a framework and language to discuss this paradoxical dynamic between seen and seer, who remain separate yet engaged in some same frameworks. Before property release, realizes the nature of Purusha, Purusha is concealed and the divine remains hidden. After being seen, the lone dancer retreats and becomes engaged in a shared dance with the formless, becoming a super conductor for the gunas, transcending duality because of this reintegrated and newly expanded identity. So the metaphor of dance substantiates the belief in body, embodied cognition. And it um, is the same embodiment that led Arjuna viewing Krishna's magnificence with his own eyes in the Bhagavad Gita to wake up to his dharma on the bat battlefield. Um, I just wanted to show this photo because as I was looking at images of quantum entanglement, the infinity sign and the number eight, um, and from the perspective of image schemas and linguistics, I saw a relationship between their structures and started considering, considering the metaphorical component um, of this shape as it pertains to Prusha and property, which Kayla actually talked about too. Um, I'll let you do what you want with that, but I just wanted to dem demonstrate from Samkhya Karaka um, some parts that talk about cosmic dance. So just as a dancer stops dancing when the charade ends, so also prophecy seizes once the nature of Prusha is revealed. There is nothing more exquisite than prophecy who exclaims, I have been seen and retreats from the view of Prusha. Therefore, no one is bound, no one is released. It's only property in the various postures that transmigrates, is bound, and it's free. Such a good line. <laughs> um, so there's this juxtaposition and paradox between being bound and also not being released that, um, that ties into quantum entanglement. And it arose from 20th century physicist Niels Bohr and describes how particles that have once interacted become entangled and correlate with one another's internal states, regardless of the distance, spatial or temp temporal between the two particles. Um, so they should be treated as a whole and not separate from one another. It helps explain concepts like telepathy, as in reading another's mind, in terms of that there's something happening between particles which once interacted, that are tuned into each other or connected, echoing how when Purusha and Prakriti come close together, they start harmonizing in ways that defy the visual and spatial. Niels Bohr believed that quantum reality is objectively indefinite, and empirical testing has substantiated this quantum framework. So Kripal believes quantum frameworks are challenging for society to accept because they defy all Newtonian conventions taught in the education system. And it takes attention from some sort of moment to flip it on its head and um, change that script. So the question I'm asking then is how might one integrate new conceptual metaphors, both intellectually understand and embody the creative paradoxical aspect of reality, and how might one wrote widely approach discarding stale metaphors and viewed in platitude and societal um, programming? And so like, how might we read a text like the Yoga Sutra in a responsible way and do our best to remove those biases and maybe open our, our ourselves to changing our views on the cities uh, on something that is controversial and does seem to trigger people. So I believe it starts with following a multi-layered framework like that one outlined in the Yoga Sutra, which contains the space for both the paradoxical aspect of reality to unfold and the necessary practical structure 
at least someone like me, me I need structure um, within that to focus the senses and evolve consciousness towards higher states of harmonized embodiment. It requires reorganizing a subtle body to align with the tattvas. And one mark of this process unfolding is the city. So just for the sake of time, I'll just go quickly over a couple of other considerations is Rupert Sheldrake builds on what is seen in Tottis three and four, writing about morphic fields, which organize the bodies of plants and animals through vibratory patterns and non-local phenomena, such as telepathy, where minds are extended beyond brains through these fields and the effects of attention and intention are detected experimentally. Um, so he believes that nature has a collective memory. And then Edward Kelly has the filter thesis, yet a near-death experience, and came up with this idea that our brain blocks out or veils the larger cosmic background. So both of these invoke some of the metaphors that I've been talking about. And then there's yogi pranayaksha and Jainism, and also perfections mentioned in yoga chana and Buddhism. And so to conclude, the Yoga Sutra offers a quantum framework for the practitioner to embody philosophy on the path to freedom. And this framework would imagine a universe where the cities are natural, albeit still a result of some modicum of discipline and ongoing practice. The ability to intensely focus, as in some yama, does not occur spontaneously. It must be cultivated and approached with intent and responsibility. Rejecting the classical materialist and Newtonian Cartesian model of reality upheld by Western Protestant hermeneutical principles and opening up to a metaphorical and imaginal foundation for meaning making as conceptualized in Pada 3 and 4 of the Yoga Sutra may explain the effectiveness of yoga and other subtle body disciplines. So thank you for listening. <laughs>